as you can see, the display is gibberish, and the suspicion is that's because the dynamic RAM is not working properly. And just yesterday, I had a glimmer of hope as to why that might be. I was looking around these PAL devices, which I've been able to read the contents of, but there's a couple of signals that run from one to the other, and one of them goes directly, that's here, and another one goes via this AND gate into there. And the other half, the, the other signal in the AND gate is pulled up to 5 volts. So I thought, I wonder what this signal is that might pull that down. If, it, if it's not being pulled down, then it's high and it's just a pass-through. But if it gets pulled down, then that signal will be blocked. So following it through on the schematic, there's that pull-up resistor there and follow that signal down and it goes to this expansion bus P11 expansion interface but if we look at that signal it's um, unlike most of this schematic which is fairly readable that's not but if I look in the documentation the expansion bus P1 and right we're, we're interested in P1 pin 11 and Pin 11, Memdis, active low, memory disabled. And I thought, wow, that would explain things because I've had issues with this, two other issues with this expansion interface where signals were low when they shouldn't have been. So if that was being held low, then that would stop the memory working and that would be an explanation. So the thing is to uh, check that out. So that goes into here, which is U20 pins 9, 10 and 8. So pin 10 should be high, but if it's low, that would disable the memory. So get out the crystalloscope and have a look. Okay, so we're interested in U20 pin 10. And this is the first time I've looked, so this, this is sort of live. The oscilloscope's at 5 volts per division, so it should jump up one grid width. U20, there's pin 8. Oh, he's got a signal in. Pin 9 and pin 10. He's high. Oh well. That doesn't explain the problem then, does it? Would it be nice? So, um, I'm back to my previous debugging strategy, which is to replace every chip I can find to do with that memory system and see if replacing one of them makes things come good. Alright, back to that. So I visited the Salvos and scored this Dick Smith Electronics <laughs> uh, Televis for 25 bucks. Seems to work. Um, it's got all sorts of inputs, HDMI and VGA. It's even got a CD player on the side of it. Presumably it's colour, must be. And it'll do as a monitor for this thing. Although it does seem to be cutting up the bottom of the row, so I might have to do some uh, fine tuning of the video parameters in the that, that come from the ROM. It's a bit curious that there aren't many recognisable characters. In fact, the only one I can see really is, is the right hand curly bracket. Everything else is just weirdo characters. So anyway, I've also got a bunch of chips, not not every chip involved around the RAM, but most of them. So um, I'll start playing with substituting those and see if I can get any changes up here. Okay, I've been changing a lot of these chips around here that are to do with the RAM, all that I can, and I think I've pretty much covered them over here as well. Um, so that didn't help. I'm still getting this, and I checked, I powered it off and on each time I changed the chip, and basically getting the same stuff every time. Uh, so I've got to find a different approach, a different angle of attack. Yes, so looking at the display again, this random stuff, uh, is it really coming out of the RAM? Who knows? The thing, the thing that strikes me is that there are very few normally used characters. There's a lot of the graphics characters, but there's an A, another A, and, and it's interesting. well that's a good clue isn't it? That's got to be interesting. I have to check that out. I haven't noticed that before, but there's a um, pattern to where that A is, and it 
repeats down here. So I'll look into that. Um, but yes, there, there aren't many characters like those. It seems to be a lot of the graphics. And I have previously read out the contents of that character, gener character generator and uh, went ahead and wrote a little program that would turn it up in display format. Yes, so, and here, here are the graphics characters that we're seeing some of, and yeah, it's curious that we're not seeing any of these characters. I want to investigate that, and now that I've got this, I know what codes I'm seeing on the screen when I see these characters. So uh, let's, let's have a, a look at some of them. I should probably try and note that uh, the spacing for these A's, in case that's important, so it looks like there's... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, eighty, hundred and sixty, two hundred and forty, plus sixteen, two hundred and fifty six. That's significant. We'll keep that in mind. And look at some of these characters. Uh, we've got this little jigger which is which is ah, I think that is the tilde, which is 7E. The thing next to it appears to be this, 7F. By the way, um, just looking at the character generator, there, there's the RAM array, and two bytes at a time are captured into these two latches, which are then ultimately passed to the character generator ROM, and then to the shift register which outputs the video signal ultimately through this transistor into the televis and of course the horizontal and vert vertical sync signals down here get mixed in with that and there's a bit of exclusive or stuff going on here which is to do with the cursor and inverse video if we look at this these two latches seven bits go into the 2716 so 128 different codes together with or row address lines and, and looking at this um, 16 lines is much more than we need so it's the character generator ROM the ROM is probably setting the um, the CRT controller to maybe 12 or 14 lines per character maybe 12 plus 2 per into line spacing yeah so it could be up to 16 with those four things but it probably only goes to 12 or 14 and the 8th bit comes off those two latches into this exclusive wall gate and that provides the inverse video. So bit 7 is on, the, the character represented by the other 7 bits is inverse video. It's also the character, uh, the CRT controller chip also generates this cursor signal which also invokes uh, the exclusive wall gate. So the cursor looks like it's an inverse video character, but, but when you've got an inverse, when the character's already inverse video, then it turns it into normal video, presumably. I'll spare you the 40 odd minutes, no, more than an hour of footage I took of uh, me buggerizing around changing RAM chips and seeing what effects it had on the screen, but there, there was a, a few things I discovered. I was just replacing chips in these two rows and the sequence of random nonsense I got did change as I moved those chips in and out. Every second character is different, and if I took a chip out of one row or the other, then that every second character would change, because it reads two bytes at a time, one out of each of those two banks, stores them in these two latches, and presents them one at a time to the character generator. And, uh, yeah, so... Doing anything to one row and not the other would, or doing anything to one row would affect every second character. And there's a few patterns there. For instance, this inverse video happens every 128 characters and then repeats after 256. There are 80 characters to a line. The occasional different character is also repeated exactly on each successive 256 byte block. Now that's all a bit strange because remember the address line for every 128 
location is bit 7, which is also the data bit coming out of the RAMs that turns on inverse video. So it's, it's almost as if the RAM chips were just letting address 7 go through to data 7. But I, I, I've had one thought since, which I'll just show you with no chips. There we go. Now that's with no RAM chips, and we get square that, that blocky thing, this, which is code 7F. And it's got inverse video, so that means it's FF, which I guess you'd expect that, no RAM. You just read all high all the time. But if I stick in particular chips, that pattern will change. Oh, one thing that occurred to me is perhaps because the RAM chips seem to check out on that DRAM Arduino test, uh, I'm going to suppose they're not bad and maybe there's something else wrong. The only thing I can think of now is remember I had these 10 ohm resistors in a, another pack here, but that's got a missing pin and I plug this in which is 39 ohms and it should be 10 well I just thought what if I piggyback this across it so I'll have 20 ohms which is within the acceptable range it can go up to 33 and and put in two rows of chips that pass the DRAM Arduino test and see what we get up there so I'll put in two rows of chips again now we'll power on we should get random nonsense up there and we do so what I want to do now is put uh, piggyback this on here all right try again I've double decked this one so it should be 20 ohms now which is within the correct range power on and no good so I've pretty much had it with these chips um, these four double one sixes I, I need three of them this, this thing's not going to be any good until it's got a full set and I need three because I've got three duds but they're hard to get and therefore expensive they are stupid because they need three power supplies in addition to plus five they also need minus five and plus twelve i hear that they run hot and they fail often so they haven't got a lot going for them and i do have heaps of 4164s these are 16k by one chips 4164s are 64k by one chip so they've got an extra address line and uh, with a slight modification they can be put into this board so that's what I'm going to look at it next I think I'm, I've done I've had it with those chips pain in the ass so tomorrow I think I'll um I'll work on upgrading this board to use 4164s so having decided to replace these 4116 DRAM chips with 4164s let's have a look at what's involved with that now there's the pin out of a 4116 and a 4164 and there are three pins that are different the minus 5 volts on the 16 becomes no connection on the 64 the plus 12 on the 16 is replaced with plus 5 so VCC is moved from pin 9 across to pin 8 freeing up pin 9 for the extra address line A7 so if we then stick one of these where one of those belongs We'll have pin 1 connected to minus 5 volts. Well, to, set, to deal with that, we just disconnect the minus 5 volts. Pin 8, which should be connected to plus 5, is now connected to, to plus 12. So we just disconnect the plus 12 and jumper pin 8 across to pin 9. Pin 9, which is now the address A7, will still be connected to plus 5 volts. Now, that doesn't matter. We're not going to be using the extra capacity provided by that extra address line. All we need to do is make sure it's tied either high or low so that we get consistent addressing on our chip and connecting it to plus 5 volts, it's always going to be high. So that's all we have to do. Disconnect the minus 5, disconnect the 12 and join plus 5 across to where the 12 was. Now on the board, uh, plus 12 is on this pin and he runs along the outside to these four capacitors, the through hole platings on those take it to buses that run down through all the chips. That's, that's these four, one, two, three, four, so, and then up to the chips. It also goes around here to the 
floppy disk controller which needs 12 volts so we can't just not stick in 12 volts it's it's needed for that and in fact it's also needed it comes around here to the serial RS232 drivers so it's needed for those as well likewise minus 12 goes up here to the minus 5 volt regulator or we can just disconnect the regulator and that solves that but we do have to keep minus 12 volts input because it comes around here also to the RS232 drivers but it's needed for the keyboard as well because those old keyboard encoder chips need minus 12 volts so what I'm going to do is remove that voltage regulator and then the minus 5 will, will be floating and it doesn't matter it will just be no connection it doesn't matter if it's floating but I'm also going to remove C60 this, this one here because it's on the output of that regulator and should pin 1 ever become connected to a positive voltage then this capacitor will be reversed biased and it might explode so I'll pull him out as well for the plus 12 volts what I'm going to do is remove this capacitor completely and lift up the positive leg the outside leg of those three capacitors and for those three there's a wire hole there which is plus 5 that's the plus 5 volt rail so those capacitors just become bypass and filtering for plus 5 volts and they'll no longer be connecting to 12 volts and if I then drill out the those three those four holes to get rid of the through hole plating that will get, disconnect the top plus 12 volt rail from the four buses underneath now that is damaging the board but it's not easily seen and if, if ever it was needed to put this back out how it was these capacitors can just be reinstalled and soldered on both sides and their leads will act like the plating through hole plating and then having done that we'll have these four plus 12 volt bars bus bars uh, now floating and have to become connected to plus five we've effectively disconnected the 12 volts but we've got to join it across to five volts and these wires where we're going to stick the capacitors legs into that's plus five volts so all we have to do is run a wire from there to there to there to there to there to there to there and we've connected those 12 volt buses to plus five after making sure that we've completely disconnected the through hole plating so that should be all that's required and I'll do that stick in some 4164s and see what happens okay so I've implemented those changes that is taken out the minus 5 volt regulator and the capacitor on its output that's on the minus 5 volt side of things uh, the four capacitors taken one out because there's no hole to no hole for the five volts to stick its other leg in, its leg into um, but on these three taking it out of the 12 volt rail and stuck it into the five volt rail because there are three wires there to do that on the back there's the five and twelve all connected together and a bit of hot glue to hold things down and I also hot glued these other wires that were there just to keep them in order a couple of other things I did was uh, the video instead of having this soldered on I put a plug there so that the board can be standalone if need with no wires hanging off I should do similar the reset switch came off I should do similar for that so that the reset switch can be remote on the front panel or something but for now it's just there uh, underneath this crystal is a bit of old tape I've replaced that with a bit of double sided foam tape uh, I think that covers everything uh, I haven't put the 4164 chips in first I just wanted to power it on and see how much smoke comes out and, and measure the voltages on the, over here and make sure that all the voltages look good I haven't actually shorted the 5 to the 12 or something dumb like that so we'll power it up in a second ok power on and watch for smoke 
good so far. I'll just check those voltages. My volt is good. Minus 12, good. Plus 12, good. Plus 12, minus 12, 5. Alright, so now I guess I'll plug in the chips. Just see, have we get anything on the televis? I've got a very stable output. What have I done? Well, that's worse than it was before. What was going on there? Oh, bloody idiot, I had uh, the, the wires in there reversed, so let's try it again. Still without the RAM chips. Power on. Yep, and that's what you expect when there's no RAM chips fitted. Code is 7E for that character, and the negative inverse video indicates the top bit is on, so FF is what's being read out of the RAM. Now let's put some chips in. So I have got some, I believe, brand new 4164 DRAM chips somewhere in a tube, but uh, yeah, this, this whole motherboard has two rows of 4164s and two of 41256s, so I can take those two rows out, and there's another one here with just 4164s, so I'll take these out, put them in there, just, just these first 16 first. See what happens. There's all our chips in there. There's a couple of different brands, but I hope that doesn't matter. Uh, and we get a couple of spares because that old motherboard used an extra ninth bit for parity. But uh, okay. Now, if the gods are smiling upon me when I apply power, we'll get a question mark. Here we go. Maybe nope. Something different, but. No question mark. Damn it. We got a few more alphanumerics this time. Pressing reset. Doesn't do anything. Instead of inverse video for 128 and then off for 128, now we're getting inverse video for 2. So I wonder if that's a clue. Uh, maybe I'll s stick in the other uh, 16 chips and just in case. That's been my problem all along. Oh look, there's some activity. Let's reset again. Yeah, every time I press reset, we get that little ripple after a few seconds. Pressing reset, nothing's happening anymore now. Alright, I'll put the other 16 chips in, see if that makes any difference. All 64, or 32 rather, new chips are in there, so I don't think that bottom bank makes a difference, but. Here goes, power on. No. Pressing reset, doing nothing. So, what the bloody hell's wrong now? So, <laughs> I'm at my wit's end at the moment on this thing. Um, I think I'll have to put it on the back burner for some while while I do something that I haven't got sick of yet. If anyone's got any suggestions on how to proceed, things to check, uh, I'd be most interested to hear, but for the moment it's going on the back burner. And then I've got a, a new thing to play with, a new distraction to keep me busy for a little while at least, is cleaning up all these silver coins. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this. I'm, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to produce a result. That's the thing I wanted more than probably anyone who might watch this. Um, yeah, anyway, catch you later.